<laughs> so, so thanks to Alex and Scott for inviting me to this esteemed group. Uh, I'm sorry I screwed up the exact title of the conference on my slides. I hope you won't hold it against me. Um, so I don't actually work uh, on market design explicitly, but um, you know, in the spirit of the conference, I'm trying to sort of tee up some issues uh, that I see in low-income housing policy in an area where I've done some work um, and sort of explain why I think it might be uh, amenable to a market design approach. Uh, so just a quick roadmap, I'll talk a little bit about why maybe we should care about low-income housing policy. Uh, then I'll jump into sort of the two major areas that I'll discuss. Um, I'll spend a lot of time talking about the system of homeless assistance delivery. Uh, and then I'll talk about sort of issues related to housing vouchers and neighborhood quality. So why do we care about low-income housing generally? Um, so for one thing, the federal government spends a lot of money uh, on low-income housing. Uh, in, so about $50 billion a year. Um, about $20 billion of that's for housing vouchers, um, close to $10 billion each in a public, public housing and a program called Project Based Section 8 that looks pretty similar. And then another 7 or $8 million in a program called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. Um, so it makes up a substantial portion of uh, uh, discretionary spending, um, and it's an important part of the safety net. And low income housing programs really operate with sort of a variety of rationales. Uh, and sort of if you want to learn more about those, uh, in a moment of self-promotion, I have a chapter with Jens Ludwig and Ingrid Allen where we sort of talk about uh, these various rationales and their historical root. Um, but basically, you know, homeless progr uh, housing programs are designed to address homelessness. We have about a half a million homeless um, as enumerated each January in the streets or in shelters. Um, it's designed generally to, to address what's known as housing affordability, which basically is just people spending a large fraction of their income on rent. Um, and then obviously there's connections to both segregation and desegregation. Historically, some housing policies were used to, to sort of enforce segregation, uh, at least implicitly. Um, now sort of more housing programs are aimed at trying to reduce uh, segregation or to desegregate. And then there's some housing programs really focused on sort of these ideas of neighborhood effects and making place and investing in uh, distressed communities. So there's a bunch of different rationales. Uh, I think an important feature for people that care about market design is the second to last bullet that much of housing assistance is rationed. So only about one in four eligible households receive low income housing assistance. Um, and yet there's been virtually you know, no papers uh, from market designers on low income housing policy. And a, a, an exception is uh, a paper that Neil has that's terrific and he'll talk about it next. Um, so allocation problems in low income housing. Uh, I think there's a lot of areas where sort of uh, market designers could engage generally uh, with low income housing policy. So sort of which eligible people get assistance, what type of assistance do they get, how long do they wait for it, does that assistance uh, tie to a particular building, do, where do they go um, ultimately in terms of the neighborhoods they select into, and then sort of you know which buildings should we keep, which ones should we demolish, which should we redevelop, et cetera. So I talk about sort of three uh, allocation problems in my chapter. Um, the first one is really around the assistance or the delivery of homeless assistance um, and how we think about getting sort of these different types of programs to the families and individuals that are at, rim at imminent risk of homelessness. Um, the second one that I talk about in my chapter I won't go into today is really about uh, how we think about ordering sort of public housing and voucher wait lists. Um, and then the third is uh, related to issues of how we get housing voucher holders uh, to move to areas of lower poverty or sort of higher opportunity. So, um, in terms of homelessness in the U.S., there's about a half a million homeless in the U.S. Uh, since 2006 or so. Um, we've been doing annual counts uh, that re rely basically on a volunteer army uh, and a bunch of homeless organizations, but it's a pretty well-organized situation. And I'm, if you're at all interested in uh, this field, I encourage you to participate in these voluntary counts. They're pretty sort of illuminating. Um, and so those are conducted in January. They're really designed to establish a lower bound on the number of homeless um, at, at, at any given point in time. Um, and there's about 70% of the homeless are in shelters and about 30% are on the street. Um, of course, many more people over the course of the year might experience some homelessness. So we think that that number is close to about one and a half uh, million people experiencing some, experiencing some type of homelessness uh, during the course of the year. Um, as I think people's mental pictures uh, you know, would would lead them about uh, the the street homeless population is overwhelmingly single adults um, and primarily male. Um, but I think an important thing to keep in mind is that um, uh, nearly half of the sheltered population is families with children. So 
um, and, and children themselves make up about a quarter of the, the nation's homeless. So these are really the most vulnerable people in our society. And so even though the numbers may not seem huge to some of you, uh, you know, there, there could be important gains. And, and so um, what do we think are sort of the costs of homelessness? So there's uh, at least anecdotally sort of enormous private costs to people being homeless. Um, there's not great causal studies, as you might imagine. We can't sort of randomly make people homeless, or, or that would be tremendously unethical. Uh, but but they have the homeless have much higher rates of mortality. They have uh, obviously a lot of psych psychological distress. You know the causality arrows you know point in both directions. But um, uh, you know I think these there, there's evidence to suggest that there's li large private costs. There's been some more recent interesting work on the effects of uh, childhood homelessness using data in Australia. That's really rich. Um, and basically finds that sort of if you experience homelessness uh, earlier in childhood, you have sort of wor worse employment uh, and education prospects than if you're experiencing it later in life. Um, those are sort of the private costs. What are the social costs, right? So it's very costly ultimately to uh, serve the homeless population in sort of what we refer to as emergency shelters. So you can see I, I just put in a couple of estimates from different studies and you know, depending on if we're talking about families, um, families over the course of a year or a bed or an individual, the cost can vary quite a bit. So families are very costly to house. You're generally not housing a homeless family in a homeless shelter for an entire year. So the 57,000 number um, is somewhat deceiving in that sense, but um, you know, it costs about $16,000 to operate sort of uh, a homeless shelter bed over the course of a year to have one available. Um, and so that's quite high. That's considerably more than the cost of, say, giving somebody a housing voucher. Um, and a lot of this relates to there's some services um, delivered in shelters in addition to things. Um, and so then, you know, the homeless are also uh, heavy users of other services generally offered by government. So, um, you know, you hear about sort of heavy healthcare usage from, uh, from emergency departments, the police, incarceration, um, lots of sort of government costs. And then finally, right, we think there's probably some disutility to us that aren't homeless to seeing people homeless, you know, I, I think it's a, you know, can be a disturbing thing and, and we'd like all else equal, you know, for society to, to be able to stimulate sort of more consumption of housing in this, in this group. So um, what are the programs that are really designed to, to deal with homelessness? Um, a lot of housing attention and economics uh, and and generally focuses on what I'll call sort of the mainstream housing programs. These are things like housing vouchers, public housing, and, and a large production program called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. Um, these are very effective at causing people not to be homeless. If you give somebody a voucher, it doesn't have many restrictions. It's a pretty good tool to keep people from uh, becoming homeless into the future. The problem really is that these don't explicitly target homeless, and consequently, they, they often don't reach uh, those uh, that are homeless at a very high rate. So I have some work. Uh, using lottery housing assistance in Miami, both public housing and vouchers. And in that study, sort of over a seven year period, only 5% of the families that never got uh, public housing or a voucher offer um, became homeless. And you know, based on a sort of recent HUD survey, only about 10% of the local government agencies responsible for administering housing assistance um, had what's known as like a strong general preference for homeless, where they would basically sort of you know rate homeless higher than sort of other housing circumstances that 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 might uh, invoke need. So paying a lot for housing or, or being overcrowded. Um, and so those are the mainstream programs. And really, the other programs, there's a set of programs that are explicitly designed to target homelessness. Um, and I'm going to talk about those now. So um, the three general ones uh, are rapid rehousing, transitional housing, and permanent supportive housing. And there's a lot here, and I really don't have time to go into sort of the nuance uh, of each, but they basically vary in the duration of assistance provided. They vary in whether it's project-based or tenant-based, like given you know, a subsidy to somebody that they can then take to a private unit versus getting moved into a particular lo location with, with a bed available. They vary um, in the service intensity that's required, whether or not you have to participate in financial counseling, case management, all this stuff. Uh, in some cases, there's no requirements. And they also vary a bit in whether or not providers have explicit preferences over certain types of candidates. So how does the current design, or how's the current system look in terms of how it's designed? So it's a referral-based system. Um, and basically, at-risk individuals or families um, undergo some type of intake that can be either centralized or decentralized. Often, it's like a call center. In New York, it's like a, a, a location in the Bronx that they'll like bus you to. And you basically um, go there, and you basically uh, 
get filled out for sort of an initial sort of diversion screen, what they'll say, like, can they find family members that you can stay with? Can you get a particular type of prevention assistance uh, that could quickly resolve your problem? Um, and then typically what will happen is people will transition then to um, a full-on housing and prioritization assessment where essentially caseworkers are working with the individual or the family and they're given a tool that basically uh, sort of diagnoses their 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 housing situation looks at sort of their bar various barriers to to getting stably housed um, and suggests a particular option so it's rapid rehousing or they get suggested for transitional housing or they're you know they have a mental barrier and they think permanent supportive housing that has more intensive case management um, they're they're recommended for one of those. So this, the staff use this assessment basically to determine where people should be on the waiting list for that given intervention. Um, and then when a household reaches the top of the list, uh, they're then basically, they work with their case manager to reach out to the, uh, the providers of that given program and say, do you have a slot available? Um, if yes, then you get sent to that provider. Uh, if no, then they might look at sort of your second highest, like matched, best matched intervention. Um, and this presents, I think, some problems. Uh, so sort of what are the character, why do we think the current system might not be ideal? Um, and really from a market design perspective, um, this challenge is really about matching people to the available assistance uh, that they prefer. Um, and one of the challenges is simply that there's uh, tremendous search friction. So if homeless families or individuals basically work with these case managers and they really have to sort of shop around to these various network, this network of different providers that are nonprofit agencies typically. Um, and so you know, you're calling up, the case manager's calling up, asking about bed availability for different things, asking if they have funding available for rapid rehousing. Um, and often these aren't, these aren't managed in a very centralized way. And so it can be difficult to sort of overcome these frictions. And we think generally it's good to get people sort of rapidly resolved and not have them waiting, them, waiting for weeks in shelters, uh, trying to figure out sort of what the available option is. The current system uh, leaves a lot of households sort of unmatched, if you will, not actually res like leaving the shelter with a form of assistance. Now, some of, you know, a, a sanguine view would say like these families are getting out and on their own and they haven't, they, they've, you know, had no need for additional assistance, but these are also sort of the most vulnerable families. Or, uh, so we think generally most of these programs could be, provide some, deliver some benefit, but about 30%, uh, at least in a recent study of, of families in shelters left without getting some additional housing program. Um, these assessments and referrals, uh, they're, they're defined again by this assessment tool. And so they're not sort of over specific preferences about how long people have to wait uh, for a given form of assistance, what their preferred form of assistance would be. Um, and individuals themselves often lack information about sort of uh, when funding is likely to become available into the future and, and sort of how long they would have to wait for these various programs. So this, this is not communicated well to the, to the homeless clients, um, uh, which creates some problems. And there's actually no systematic mechanism. Some providers have preferences for certain types of candidates and you can go through this whole process, get referred to an agency, the family can show up in the agency and then be rejected. And there's not really a, a coherent strategy for getting people back into the system and finding a new program that works for them. So that's problematic. Um, so what are some important design considerations? Uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest there's tremendous preference heterogeneity across uh, families, so preferences over location. You know, if, you're, if it's a project-based project versus uh, you know, a subsidy that you can take to a private landlord, you're gonna prefer you know, units maybe that are close to home or close to your church or close to people you know. Um, there's a terrific study that uses data from a recent uh, large HUD experiment where they basically randomly assigned 2,000 homeless families in shelters to those different interventions that I just named, rapid rehousing, transitional housing, or a voucher. Um, and that study was primarily uh, you know, aimed at looking sort of what the effects of each of those arms would be on homelessness and other outcomes. But there's really fascinating data in there on people's preferences and based on, and, and simply on sort of the take up rates of being assigned priority in these different intervention arms. So um, in that study, basically, uh, people that were assigned a priority uh, for a housing voucher saw a 72 percentage point increase in their take up of, of housing vouchers. Um, for rapid rehousing, it was 40 percentage points and transitional housing, it was 25 percentage points. So you, that suggests people have you know, different preferences over, 
over these types, these programs. Um, so what are some other design considerations? I mentioned both heterogeneity and preferences over the type of assistance, but also um, issues between sort of provider and client preferences. And is this really sort of like a two-sided market in a way if providers have preferences over particular people and people have pre preferences over particular types of assistance? Um, there's also issues of treatment effect heterogeneity. Some of these interventions, uh, you know, giving a very chronic, homeless family, very short-term assistance uh, may not be you know, a very worthwhile endeavor, may not have a large effect on their ability to stay uh, out of homelessness for a while, but could be very effective um, for sort of a temporary uh, homeless situation. But really sort of at the core of all this issue is, is private information. So people have information about uh, their true housing needs and providers often you know, do a lot of work to try to extract and elicit sort of their true status, housing status, and we spend a lot of money basically trying to you know, confirm that people don't actually have housing needs. So can we create a system that basically elicits that information more naturally um, and, and you know, deals with some important issues, particularly like moral hazard and adverse selection. So in, I don't have a lot of time left, but um, in New York, basically, there was something called Dinkins Deluge, where they changed some housing preferences and people flocked to shelters because they thought that was their ticket to the voucher. So, um, you know, moral hazard and, and adverse selection are issues. Um, uh, in terms of adverse, solving adverse selection, I have a project trying to use machine learning to identify sort of to get at the issue of private information, figure out who's really at risk. Um, there's a similar concept sort of using smartphone, trying to think about could we give smartphones to the homeless? Um, and then sort of, uh, you know, on moral hazard, could we sort of institute ordeal mechanisms uh, or, or certain types of contracts uh, to basically resolve things? So future tasks, uh, you know, it's pretty simple, right? You just have to design a market where the dominant strategy is truth telling. They deals with dynamic matching environment, produces fast, efficient, and stable matches, addresses moral hazard, and serves the neediest household. So I'm sure you guys are up to it. Um, I think there's a lot of, so I have like probably what, four minutes left or something. Um, I'm gonna talk really briefly about the issue of how to get vouchers to better neighborhoods. Um, vouchers don't actually cause people to move to better neighborhoods. This is like a dispiriting fact in the housing voucher program. Um, why? Because we think better neighborhoods produce better outcomes. Um, the key fact I want you to take here is that one in three households issued a voucher can't successfully lease up with their voucher and that the rent ceilings that are set, so the subsidy cap on a voucher doesn't change across a metro area. So it's the same if you're trying to lease up in Winnetka or Evanston as if you're trying to uh, lease up in Washington Park or another impoverished neighborhood on the south side. Um, so uh, basically in a paper uh, with Peter Ganong, another grad student actually who's starting at the Harris School in another year, um, we study sort of whether or not this issue of voucher holders basically weighing the probability of finding a unit versus the quality of that unit and what the effects of that mean for sort of uh, um, ultimately the quality that they get. And we look at basically what happens if you just raise the subsidy cap everywhere so you allow vouchers to be more generous across all neighborhoods. And we contrast that with what if you set the subsidy cap for the voucher, the ceiling, um, based on sort of local rents in a neighborhood. So it's higher and higher opportunity or higher rent neighborhoods and lower and lower rent neighborhoods. Does that change people's behavior? Um, we, this was actually implemented in Dallas. Uh, so we do sort of a little quick diff and diff of voucher holders in Dallas that were affected by this change in 2010 um, and contrast them with voucher holders in neighboring Fort Worth that were unaffected. Um, and you know, it's a, we, we find evidence that they've uh, moved, to, moved to better neighborhoods in response um, in terms of sort of the size of the neighborhood improvements and where they're coming through. Um, it's primarily through people selecting into neighborhoods with lower violent crime. So these are all standardized such that they're positive impact. So, uh, you know, this is a third of a standard deviation uh, improvement in the violent crime uh, in your neighborhood. Uh, similar, fairly similar size effects for, for poverty and unemployment. So some evidence that basically uh, folks use this new voucher that was more generous in, in higher opportunity neighborhoods and was cut uh, in lower opportunity neighborhoods to actually take it and, and, and sort of move to nicer neighborhoods. So we quantify it overall. It's about a, a quarter standard deviation in, in neighborhood quality. Um, and actually, as a, you know, uh, I can't say strongly as a result of our research, but um, at least somewhat inspired by our research, HUD has proposed to change uh, basically the way they set the ceiling of the voucher to do this sort of zip level, zip code level ceiling policy. Um, in, in over 30 different metro areas, including Chicago. Um, and so folks in Chicago are excited about this as a possible lever to uh, induce people to move to better quality neighborhoods. So areas for future design work in 
in the housing voucher program and on this challenge of getting voucher holders to better neighborhoods. Um, could we design basically landlord lists that, that housing authorities give voucher holders in a better way uh, that steers them to better opportunity? Um, what mechanism you know, should determine ultimately who gets things like counseling assistance, which isn't provided to everybody? Um, and you know, could we provide some sort of information device, you know, an app that was programmed up to find units in better neighborhoods and, and really sort of improve matching in that respect? So just to conclude, Housing programs are complex and they're incredibly fragmented and you can approach me with questions uh, if you have them after, after this and I'll try to help, but I think there's many interesting challenges posed by them. Um, there's some really interesting applications that uh, I think could matter for these important policy problems like homelessness and, and sort of segregation. Uh, and that really, they're, they're, in many cases, these programs are administered in a fairly decentralized fashion, which I think creates an opportunity for experimentation uh, across different sites. Um, and you know, another positive is really that housing agencies are increasingly being required by HUD to collect uh, high quality administrative data. So a lot of this data actually exists out there um, if researchers can get access to it.